Hey everyone, welcome back to day number 14 of our devotional reading through the book of Luke up to Christmas Eve. We are in Luke chapter 14 and Jesus is on the move and actually what we what we find is he is at a dinner party, he's at a table and he gives us a a pretty thorough teaching about life in the kingdom, life following him. He's carrying on with a theme of what the narrow road is like. Uh, Jesus has said that the road to destruction is wide and many find it, but the narrow way that leads to life, uh, that's the one that he's teaching on. And so I'm excited to share with, uh, with you all how God spoke to me as I was studying Luke 14. But let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, I just wanna thank you for this time. Uh, Lord, I pray for my friends here. I, I pray that they would uh, be able to uh, to see your goodness through Luke 14. Lord, I pray for everyone participating in this challenge. I know that there are there are many who who have been enjoying uh, this this daily reading through the book of Luke. And so, Lord, I just ask that you'd continue to strengthen them uh, and be with us now. For we're praying this in Jesus' name, Amen. So Luke 14 picks up right at a uh, a question. Jesus is, is asked a question. Um, well, really, Jesus himself asks a question, and it's because of an incident where people are watching Jesus rather closely. In fact, that's what it says. And uh, beginning in verse 14, or in beginning in chapter 14, it says, it happened that he, when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. They're watching Jesus closely. They're anticipating him doing something that makes him a hypocrite or makes his uh, undermines his teaching, uh, which really should make us, uh, anyone who is a religious leader, it, it should cause us to pause and recognize the impact of our lives. Uh, sometimes we can get caught up in what we say, what we teach, but our lives really indicate whether or not we believe what we say. And if there's an inconsistency between what we proclaim to believe and what we live out, then it, it'll do more harm than good. And there are people who watch uh, watch religious leaders closely. Uh, in fact, it reminds me of a quote from D.L. Moody where uh, he says, uh, out of a hundred people, One person may read the Bible, or one person will read the Bible, and 99 will read that one person. Uh, And so, uh, as a pastor, as somebody who is in a position of spiritual leadership, uh, I was reminded that I need to to consider how I live my life, what my actions look like, uh, because I want to give a good representation of the Jesus that I follow. The only true Jesus. So he, uh, he comes into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath day to eat bread, and they're watching him closely. And in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to eat on the Sabbath or not? So he, he sees that they're watching him closely, and here's this man who needs help, and he asks them, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent, and he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And then he asks them another question. And I love this question because it speaks to the practicality of, Je- of Jesus' ministry and really the practicality of the gospel. Because Jesus turns to them after they couldn't answer, Is it lawful to heal this man on the Sabbath? And he heals him, sends him away, and then he says, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? Now, Jesus here is is addressing a held institution, which is this concept of Sabbath observance. And what had happened is over, over years, Sabbath observance had become more strict. When... In reality, Sabbath observance, there are several Sabbath values to help us observe Sabbath. The first is to stop, right? We stop from working. uh, We we stop from our labor. We stop from from working to get ahead. We rest. 
Um, it is not a, a day for maybe just naps, although Sabbath naps are amazing. They just tend to uh, transform you. They, they're, it's almost like they're packed with more rest. Uh, but So Sabbath naps are good, but, but rest in the sense of we rest from our labors of trying to get ahead in life. We don't answer emails. We're, we're not trying to come up with the next uh, entrepreneur endeavor. We're not making sales. We're not requiring other people to work on our behalf. We, we want to give them rest. Uh, and so we stop, we rest, we uh, delight, uh, which is, you know, really playing. We get out in, in nature. We, we get out in God's creation, the natural playground. And then we worship. Uh, we we worship God. We we're t- intentional about our worship with Him, and so we stop, rest, delight, and worship. Um, and that's really four uh, consistent Sabbath values all throughout Scripture. But what had happened is religious leaders had started to make the Sabbath more strict and more of a burden. And so here they're wondering: Is Jesus going to heal this man on the Sabbath? That's forbidden. And Jesus reminds them of their hypocrisy because He says after healing them. Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, and Jesus brings it home to them personally. Like, if they have something personal, then they they will do that. But they don't go out of their way to help other people who might they might not know. And you know, that's just a that's just something that tends to happen where we come up with we come up with reasons as to why other people are not living up to the standard, but we ourselves are maybe not as consistent because, well, we know. And so we're confident and we're comfortable because it, uh, we know what Sabbath is. We know how to observe Sabbath. And so if something happens, well, we are within our right to help. Surely God will will wink at you know our, our thing. Surely God understands our dilemma. Uh, and so we need to make sure that that we we have that consistency in in our faith, uh, but but Jesus is just highlighting that the religious leaders of his day are hypocritical. Um, that that they've they've missed the mark. They they don't understand the grasp, uh, or they they're not grasping his kingdom and what he came for. Which is the mission statement of Jesus is he came to seek and save the lost. Um, So he's at this table and he began speaking a parable after healing this man with dropsy. He began speaking a parable in verse 7 to the invited guests when he noticed how they had had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so here Jesus, he he notices that individuals were, were carefully uh, picking their seats and, and they wanted the, this prestige. And, and Jesus is saying, look, my kingdom is different. My kingdom is, we do not seek to exalt ourselves. No, we, we seek to exalt others. And so he's speaking to these guests on, on something that I think could really uh, speak to our present day and age, which is uh, to, to not seek to exalt ourselves, but to be happy for somebody else. Sometimes it's really difficult to celebrate another's success. Sometimes it's really difficult to celebrate another's success. Sometimes it's uh, when we're going through a difficult time and somebody else is getting that promotion or, or it looks like God is blessing them when we've been praying, it's really hard to celebrate somebody else's success. But here Jesus is saying, look, in his kingdom, he who is humble, he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so we shouldn't be seeking the highest seat at the table. We, we shouldn't be seeking the prestige. No, we, we should be seeking the lowest. We should be seeking to serve. And, and it reminds me uh, to back up a little bit in, ver- in chapter 12, how Jesus gives a parable of being in readiness and how the servants who are in readiness, that when the master comes home, he will gird himself to serve. And so it shows that, that Jesus is in perfect alignment with his teaching, his, his understanding of servant 
leadership. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. It, it, it's almost like, you know, January 1st is the day of the year where most people go to the gym. That's when everyone says, I'm gonna get fit. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna accomplish my fitness goals this year, and so they go to the gym January 1st. And I, I remember, uh, when I was when I was growing up and, and I was working out on a, on a uh, even more consistent basis than I do now, you know I, I would I was not the prototypical guy that was you know always trying to act as if I was the strongest in the room or I wasn't I wasn't trying to tell people that I was going to the gym or or anything like that because I simply knew that uh, there would be more there would be other individuals who were stronger than me so I never wanted to try to claim to be the the fittest or the strongest because I knew that somebody would come into the gym or somebody would 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 come into the room or whatever that was significantly stronger than me and so why would I spend time trying to pretend or, or act as if I'm the strongest? Why would I seek that prestige, that, that place when surely there's going to be somebody else? I mean, I'm, I, I am not that strong compared to uh, the world's strongest man or, you know, people who regularly go and power lift or, or whatever it is. And, and Jesus here is saying, look, when you're invited to a feast, when you're invited to this celebration, don't go and seek the, the highest seat of honor. No, humble yourself, because in his kingdom, it's other-centered. It's other-centered. Let's celebrate. Let's, let's give honor to others. And in verse 12, he says, You also went on to say to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And so here Jesus is teaching and he's saying, look, we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be thinking about doing good things so that we can get better things down the road. That's, that's something that uh, is, is largely missing nowadays is just good things for good sake. Just, just because it's the right thing to do. Nowadays, everyone is expecting, well, what are you, what are you selling? What have you, what have you come to sell? And, and so we, we think to ourselves, well, uh, surely there's a catch here. No, there's no catch. The goodness is just goodness. So Jesus changes from, from speaking to the invited guests about how they shouldn't be seeking this place of lofty prestige. And then he goes on and he says, look, and even you who, who is hosting this thing, don't just invite the people that uh, you'll be able to get something better down the road from. No, invite people who can't even pay you. Don't seek to exalt yourself by inviting these nice individuals, your friends, your coworkers, those who can give you stuff in return. No, invite those who can't repay you. And then he says, uh, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And I cannot even imagine what that repayment looks like. But then it says, when one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God will be blessed. But Jesus takes this as an opportunity and jumps right into another parable because Jesus is teaching about his kingdom that from our perspective looks upside down, but that's because we live in an upside down world and his kingdom is right side up. And so he jumps right back into a parable. Verse 16, he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited a many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges, and compel them to come in, so that they may, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my dinner. And then Jesus jumps right into a teaching on discipleship. And that's because uh, he's seeking to teach 
this this gathering, this this communal gathering at this table, a very important lesson about the kingdom of God, which is to live in the kingdom means to do things in an upside down manner according to this world. We're not to exalt ourselves, we're to exalt others. We're not to do good so that we get better down the road. No, we're to do good because that's what we should do. That's that's what naturally flows out of the heart of Jesus' followers, of citizens of his kingdom. And then he tells the story about how there are going to be individuals who were invited, who were given this invitation, but it was second, coming to this feast, an amazing feast. I mean, Jesus here is picking up on the theme of blessed is everyone who will eat, bre- uh, eat bread in the kingdom of God. And yet he tells a story of how people are invited to this big dinner and they come up with other reasons as to why they can't attend. And that's simply because they don't prioritize going to this dinner. They don't prioritize going to the dinner. And so this man, he, he, he's, he's let down, he's, he's frustrated, he shows emo- emotions, and so he goes and he just invites anyone that is willing to come to get an invitation to this dinner is you just have to be willing to, to come right then and there because the food is ready. You don't have to, to be perfect, you don't have to be polished, you don't even have to have the perfect attire, just come, just show up. And here Jesus is, is teaching something about following him, which is that he really, his, his manner, seeking the kingdom of God, should be first. It's, it's, it's what he came into the world to do was to establish his kingdom, to grow his kingdom. He came preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, which is turn from the way that you were heading and head in the direction of the kingdom. And so Jesus, after telling this parable, he just jumps in to a teaching on discipleship, which is now large crowds were going along with him. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first uh, first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. And then Jesus says this, Therefore, salt is good. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? For it is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is a rather intense teaching from Jesus where he's he's saying look to be my disciple you have to surrender all there's no holding on to anything and bringing that into this discipleship process no you have to be willing to surrender all and what allows what enables what inspires you to do that what inspires one to do that well it's an understanding that the way of life that this world presents ultimately leads to death I mean, we, we follow uh, guidelines, we follow a culture that, that is burning us out. We're overworked, we're, we're not able to, to see the flourishing that we, were, we felt like we were promised. We, we want to do so many other things and we're not able to accomplish them. And yet Jesus here is saying, look, I have an alternative. I have an alternative, but it's a narrow road. And that's because it's a specific road. The, the reason why the road is wide that leads to destruction is because it's, it's, it's not specific. But the narrow road is specific. It, it requires obedience. It requires surrender of everything. But as you surrender everything, you gain all of the good things that your heart truly desires. It reminds me of this picture that I saw when, when I'd uh, been a Christian for several years and it was Jesus, and he was asking this, this little girl 
for her teddy bear and she's holding this teddy bear in her arms and it's a small teddy bear and he's got his arms stretched out and you can see on her face the sadness of I don't want to give it up but behind his back is an even bigger teddy bear and that really captures sometimes our dilemma, which is God asks us to, to give up things and we think, God, but I love this. And we don't realize that he actually has better things in his hands. And so instead of getting caught up in, in how, you know, how we're supposed to have life in this world, no, 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 no. When we, when we stop and we pause and we say, you know what, Jesus, yes. Because of, because of you, because of your sacrifice, I'm, I lay down all. I lay down my life. I lay down my preferences. I lay down my itinerary. I lay down my agenda. I lay down my own exaltation. I lay down my pursuit of, of good things. Lord, I, I lay down all things. Jesus says, in that laying down, you will find true life. You find true life. So as I read this, it was just it was just a reminder that I need to I need to not let myself, even as a pastor, even as a pastor, I need to not let myself get caught up in the in the trivial things of life. There's a time and a season for everything. You got to get oil changes. You got to do your taxes. You 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 want to hang out with friends. You you know you, there's there's all these things that you have to do. You got to drop the kids off at school. You got to pick them up. You want them to ha- be able to go to that sporting class or or you know get the extracurricular activity. Yes, you we we have all these concepts of the good life. But Jesus here is saying, look, if you come into my kingdom, I will show you really what this good life is all about. But in order for you to come, there has to be that prioritization. There has to be that that longing, that that right setting of priorities to where his kingdom really is number one. His work is number one. His mission is number one. His ministry is number one. And he promises that if we seek his face, if we seek him first in all things, we will find the true life. And so as I was reading this, I just couldn't help but think, wow, the road is narrow, but I'm thankful for its narrowness because if it's specific, I want a specific path to life. I don't want to have to navigate multiple paths. No, I want one that is definite, one that is specific. And so I'm thankful for Jesus and his teaching. I don't want to exalt myself. I don't want to seek to do good to, to get great things later. No, I want to exalt others. I want to celebrate them. I want them to be acknowledged. And I want to do it just because it's the right thing to do. It's, it's the ministry of Jesus. It's the Jesus thing to do. And I don't want to get caught up in, oh, I can't come to the dinner, Jesus. I want to get that invitation and say, I'm, I'm coming right now. Leaving whatever I'm doing and coming. Because... I want to be a disciple. And it was a good reminder and I'm thankful for it. Thank you for for tuning in to day number 14. I hope you've been enjoying this uh, devotional. And uh, yeah, just want to close out with a word of prayer. And then I'll see you tomorrow for day number 15. Let's pray. Father, just want to thank you for this chapter and the richness in it. Lord, I ask that you'd bless all my friends. Show us how we can be a disciple, how we can prioritize you, how we can sit at your feet and say, Lord, here I am as I am. Do an amazing work through me. For I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.